All righty. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeff. I'm here with Gulf Coast Cosmos Comics. Uh, I have the illustrious honor of introducing y'all and having welcoming y'all to the world of comics through the eyes of a Mr. Leon's Hall with 5050 Comics and Besserat DeBebe with E-Time Comics, two amazing creators that are doing some game changing things that are really going to bring storytelling to a new level. So I don't want to spend too much time introducing these fellas because they have the words and the gift of gab for themselves. And I would love for y'all to hear how they how they spill it for you. So um, without further ado, gentlemen, would you love to enter the ring with your with your titles, please? Yeah, yeah, no, I I will take it away since our main event today is Leon, and I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on him. But <laughs> let me let me let me get started. Uh, so thank you so much again, Jeff. Um, so my name is Besarad Besarad Debebe. Uh, I am the founder of Etan Comics. I am also mm -hmm. the writer of Ethiopian comic series Howie Jumba Zuhan. Uh And uh, today I'm actually super 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 excited. To talk to Leon. Me and Leon met at Gulf Coast uh, Cosmos Comics, and uh, there's just a lot I want to ask him about his work. But first, I'll let him tell you who he is. So, Leon, take it away. Certainly. Uh, good evening to all who, all who are uh, joining us. My name is Leon Hall. Um, I am a New Orleans native, uh, blown out this way in uh, 2005, and I have been um, working in education uh, just about ever since. Um, when I am not uh, somehow managing to survive teaching eighth graders, um, I am writing. I am a part owner of 5050 Comics. I'm uh, one of the writers. My, uh, I own that with my brother and our, our business manager, uh, Lanisha, in Ohio. Um, yeah, we uh, we try to tell stories uh, for um, that connect to people, certainly for people who are uh, underrepresented or, or marginalized communities. Um, very honestly, I tell people that writing these stories is a lot like just kind of playing with the action figures in my head. Uh, and you all kind of see how that how that turns out. My brother is an incredibly gifted artist, as are several of the artists that are on our on our team. Um, and it is our joy to be able to bring some of these childhood ideas and, and things that we've imagined almost for a lifetime uh, to folks and let them read them, enjoy them and, you know, uh, help us, you know, keep the thing going. So that's me in a nutshell. Awesome, awesome. So, my first question, Jeff. Please feel free to interrupt at any point if you have your own questions. But I'm, I'm gonna get started, right? Of course. So, so my first question, right, Leon, for you is, I, I genuinely want to know, like, I want to take me back to kid Leon's and his first love for this medium. When it started, how it started, what was. What was the book? What was the character? What, what what was it that made you say, "Oh my goodness, this is this is where I belong," you know? Okay, let's see. So, all the way back. All right. Um I, I'll, all right, I'll answer, I'll answer this in, in three very short parts. First part, um when I was really little, like maybe 4 or 5, I had a little um a little tape player that it had uh, a cassette that had uh, a Batman a uh, story on one side and a Superman story on the other side. Um, and I remember that Batman story was, uh, you know, Batman versus Man Bat. Like I remember to this day that Man Bat is Kirk Langstrom. And like, I remember that name because I listened to that tape over and over and over again. So I was a, a Batman fan from really little. And then I remember watching Superman with my dad, like Superman 78, watching that with my dad. And I was just blown away by this imagery. Um, and when he showed me a Superman comic, I was like, oh, wait, there's more. And that really kind of uh, turned on the machine. It turned on a lot of my imagination. Um, and uh, the third piece, I am um, thankful to be a part of the Saturday morning cartoon generation. Like I was there before that thing kind of petered out. Um, so after school uh, cartoons, before school cartoons and Saturday morning cartoons, like they really fed a lot of my um a lot of my my thirst for comics in general, but for action and adventure and storytelling, like watching these these serials happen, um, it, it that was what really kind of lit the light. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of funny, man. Like my roots are are as a DC kid, you know what I'm saying, and, and as you know early early generation anime, Speed Racer and Voltron and BattleTech, you know what I'm saying. Like that really kind of got the got the wheels turning. So 
yeah, that's kind of where the story starts. Yeah, for little Leon's, you know, falling in love with comics. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I also had uh, DC was also the way I fell in love with comics. I remember because I, the first kind of animated show that really got me into it was a like a nineteen forty eight you know, Superman clip. We only had one episode back in uh, Ethiopia and we just used to keep watching that again and again. And then it was when I came to the States, I realized that that, had, that, com that comes from comics and I was like blown away. So I'm, I'm just like so happy to, to find a fellow creator who has been, you know, <laughs> brought into this world through DC as well. So yeah. that, that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, now, did you uh, do you have siblings as well, or uh, is it? Go ahead, go ahead. Let me just quickly ask that. So, um, I was born and raised an only child until about maybe I don't know fourth, fifth, sixth grade, somewhere in there. Um, my mama remarried, and I inherited two uh, two older siblings, a brother and a sister. Um, but they were older, like they were they were kind of mid to late teens. So. I've always kind of been comfortable entertaining myself and kind of being in my own space. But even before I got my step siblings, like I had a bunch of cousins, like I've always been surrounded by cousins. So I, I like to think that I'm comfortable in my own space. Like as in, in my head, I still call myself an only child because that's where a lot of my worldview was shaped. But I've always been comfortable around other people because there have always been cousins, especially on Sundays, you know, church and Bible study and, you know, choir rehearsal and all that stuff where we would always kind of end up coming together. So I've been comfortable in, in both in both spaces. Um, so only child first, then a couple of step siblings, always had some, you know, uh, quasi siblings and my cousins. And it wasn't until like my mid 30s when I met my brother and. Uh, I was like, wait, there's another one? And my dad slipped in the conversation so smooth. Um, but yeah, I met him and it turned out that we were the way we were. Like I'm the writer and he's the artist. Um, so that's a, that's a really complicated answer to like how many siblings I have. <laughs> like, yeah, no, that, 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 the, the reason I asked you is because I, I, you know, after seeing your work Trapper and I wanted to talk to your brother as well. And uh, I wanted to understand how your relationship and you, you, your, you know, the two of you's relationship and your relationship with art and comics develop. Yeah. So this background gives me a lot of information on that. Yeah, yeah, man. So uh, take me back to when you first started writing comics, right? When, what was your first story? And how did you, how did you decide, being a fan is one thing, right? But then taking it to another level and saying, you know what? I want, I want to create my own stories. When did that happen? Okay. So my, the first story that I remember writing like on purpose that I wanted to be a story um, that I found myself trying to capture the same stuff that, that drew me in, in the cartoons. I remember writing a Thundercats story and it was based on like an episode that I had watched, but I didn't like the way that it ended. So I wanted to rewrite it and had to write my own ending. <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember writing that and I, I remember like looking down at the paper. I was at my grandmother's house after school. I'm sitting there at the dining room table. My homework is done. So I've written this story. I'm sitting there looking at it and it filled up a page, man. I must've been like maybe fifth grade. It filled up a whole page. I was so proud of myself. I was like, yeah, man, that's the stuff right there. That's it. And so my mama came to pick me up and I let her read it. To this day, I doubt she ever like actually looked at the words. But she was so encouraging. Like she was like, "Yeah, this is this is good. You should keep doing it." Um, and I think that was the first time I said to myself, "Like I enjoyed imagining the scenarios that put a story together." And I imagine I enjoyed like writing out the words. I've always been a voracious reader, so a lot of the the words I've been drinking in over years were starting to pour back out in service of all these images that I had floating around in my head. So. Um, right around, I guess, fifth grade was when I said to myself, I, I like writing things. I like writing things. Now, I didn't know that I was a writer writer until after college, I think it was when it really hit that I enjoy this thing. But not just that I enjoyed it like you like you enjoy, you know, going to Dave and Buster's every now and then. Like it took me time to recognize that 
this was really the beating of my heart. Like this is where I really live. Everything else was putting on a costume. This is who I really was. Um, and like I say, it took me a long time to arrive at that. So between, you know, fifth grade and like my mid twenties, when I really said like, this is the thing I love. Like, this is the way I speak to the world around me. This is how, mm -hmm. this is how I actually am. Um, yeah, like that, that was, that was that dining room table episode was like when the writer in me was, was born or when the seed was planted, let's say. Did you, did you use the journal? No, I did. Wow, Man, listen, mm -hmm. I did not journal until let's say, let's say about 10 years ago. I really got serious about journaling. Before then, it was just whatever would stand still long enough. Like that's where I wrote things down. Um, I was, I've, I've always had scores of notebooks that would, they were very often housed. They started off being places for, for classwork. And then I would daydream because I'm a daydreamer and I'm a doodler. And I would fill in those margins and, and spaces with the things that I would write about. Um, but I had I had never really gotten serious about journaling and making sure that I had a place to house the ideas that I had. Um, to this day, I mourn the loss of thousands of poems and stories that I thought I could remember later. Um, they're gone now. They're out in the way. Somebody gonna catch them. I ain't got them no more. <laughs> uh, you know. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. I found I found that um, if a, an idea is really really good, it's gonna come back to you. I, I, so trust me, those those brilliant ideas you've had at a young age, if they're really good and they, they're you know very impactful, <laughs> they'll come back to you. Uh, Man, you give me what, hope. Thank you for inspiring. Yeah, no, no, for sure, for sure. And the reason I asked you about the journal is because I know, like, the way you described your relationship with writing, I've heard it before with some of the greats, uh, and it's really inspiring to me one and two i know that like what they usually do is they journal very religiously forgot my they, phone was still on my fault my fault yeah no worries no worries they journal very much and they mine their ideas and into their and their stories from mm. their journals which is something i never thought about until like really i got into this work as well and so i, I wondered if if you had that practice you must have your own way now i mean of course now you said you journal but even back then you must have had some way of you know thinking about brainstorming about ideas maybe it was all up in your head and you could manage it back then would then, it be safe to to question whether your whether your your writing back then is your version of journaling maybe that was your way of encapsulating those times for you in those moments yes that would be safe before I knew before I had a, a term for it. That was yes, I, I did. I did safeguard. And the thing was a lot like me. Listen, it is amazing that I've survived in education this long. <laughs> I am not an organized person. I do not have a faithful system. I take that back. There are instances when a faithful system will kind of bubble up to the surface. But I really the, the cataloging system. Nope, it ain't there. So. But I talk about like ideas just kind of living in various notebooks strewn all over my room or strewn all over my life. Like when I would write these things down, very often between writing them down and going back to find them again, mm -hmm. it was such a hunt. And I think that that um, kind of fostered a hunger. I think it, it made me like really want to be able to find these things. And more often than not, I will in the course of looking for a I'd run across idea B and kind of be swept away on that path. So yeah, I'm much better about it now. I got a stack of journals like right behind me. There are so many journals now, so much better. Thank God for wisdom. <laughs> you are definitely a writer. This is, you, you have the writer's body. Um, so let me go on to my next question. Let's talk about your first project that you published, okay? Uh, I want you to tell us a little bit about it, but before you do that, I want you to tell us kind of like where you got kind of the inspirations and the ideas of it, how it came to you and how you how you decided basically, I think I gotta write about this. This is this is too good. This is this is not leaving me alone. You know, when when was that? What triggered that? I wanna know that and then tell us about it and you know, kind of where where it's at right now. Okay. 
let's see. So make you laugh. The very first thing that I published that had my name on it on purpose, um, <laughs> it was a book of poetry, actually. Um, I published a book of poetry maybe, I don't know, six, seven years ago. Um, and that had been cooking for a long time, like uh, before the, well, I guess up to the time that the hurricane hit New Orleans. I was part of the um, open mic poetry scene and everybody had a CD and everybody had a book and everybody, you know, kind of had a, a project going on. Um, and I had been cajoled for a long time to like write a book. Like I've been, several people were like, man, your, your work is good. We won't be able to hear it. But I had a dear friend of mine, uh, Mr. Jesse, uh, Corey Jesse, he, he's a, a principal now here in Houston. But he was one of those poets and he said, the work that you do is good. I want to be able to like read it as many times as I need to. I want to have it like at my disposal. I was like, I had never heard it put that way. I was like, okay, I'm gonna write this book. So I, uh, I combed through a whole lot of uh, old poems and and new ideas that I had had. And I cobbled all that together. A dear friend, uh, Asia Rainey with uh, Nine Pages Media, uh, she also kind of spurred me along. She's like, listen, You've been on the pot for a long time. We got to make this thing happen. I'm like, you right, you right, you right, you right. So um, she coached me along in that process and being able to have that out. Um, it was a joy the first time I held a book with my name, my stage name, but my name in my hands. Like that was, that was a gift. And at that point I said, yeah, like the stuff that had been living in, in, in my head for so long became tangible. And I was like, yeah, this is the one. This is what I want to do. Now, take that and add it to me and my brother just kind of being like, man, would it be cool if we, damn, dog, like we really, we got what it takes. Like I draw, and you write, like we got, we kind of got what it takes to make this thing happen. And so we did that for, I don't know, a year and a half, two years. And then when he finally reached out to one of his classmates and she was like, here are the things you need to do to make this thing a reality. We, uh, watched a proof of concept kind of that was kind of like rehearsal like what does it look like to submit something to the publisher and have it printed and have it in our hands like what's that like we did that first and then the idea that my brother had told me about when, when we first started talking about hey man i got this comic book idea and uh the trapper concept was you know it's somewhat autobiographical for him like he's you know a single dad you're trying to uh, raise a daughter and when he laid that idea out to me i was like all right cool let me see what i can do with that and i took it and i just you know I enjoyed, again, imagining scenarios, imagining ways that was, as a story writer, like I try to um, adhere to things that are familiar, but still serve up enough surprise for there to be a reason for you to check it out. And I cooked that on a low fire for a long time. And then the next thing you know, man, it, it came to be. Matter of fact, we were just at Comic IndyCon and I was telling folks the story. I like telling folks the story about how when he told me that idea, he said, man, you think you can write something to this? I wrote down what I thought was my, my impression of what it was that he was going for. I just wanted to make sure that the thing that he had told me was the thing that he had read on paper, like we were on the same page. It was not necessarily supposed to be what it ended up being. I gave him that treatment. I was like, okay, read this and see if I'm on the right track. See if I'm you know, in the ballpark. That boy took that and came back with like 52, 54, 56 illustrated pages. I was like, sir, that is not what I was supposed to do. That, that was rehearsal. That wasn't supposed to be like the stage performance. He was like, man, but look, the, the way the way that you wrote it, like I could see the pictures. And so I just did the drawing. I'm like, well, I guess we got ourselves a book now. And because it came back like 50 plus pages, we had to split it up into uh, part one and part two. Um, but yeah, when I saw the pictures that he had put down based on words that I had written changed me forever. I'll never be the same uh, after that. And and now, now I'm like a fiend for it. Like I, I can't wait for the next, like I have the issue three of Trapper is already written. Uh, we're working through a little mini series right now. He's, he's gonna get to that illustration. Um, I'm anxious, like I have the rest of the story mapped out. Like I am on pins and needles, man. Listen, listen. <laughs> Oh, I know that bug. I know that bug for sure. I just want to quickly <laughs> flash out what this, this gorgeous book looks like. Uh, you know what I love about 
Kappa is it almost reads like a manga to me. Uh, the way the pacing of it mm-hmm. and the the like the art has so much room to breathe mm-hmm. that it makes you want to keep turning the page, keep going and keep going. And it really like I, I'm very appreciative of how you two have balanced the writing and the art. Like I I think that we you know as you can see with the industry, uh, with the comic industry, the manga industry, more people are drawn to that manga style storytelling mm-hmm. where you have a, a, a volume or you can kind of go through with the character with several pages and understand what the arc is and things like that. So I really like uh, even the size of it, right? Even the dimensions of it are mm-hmm. manga-esque. You know, I, I like that. What, what was your decision in, in doing it that way versus the traditional comic book, you know, format? So that proof of concept issue, like mm-hmm. when we were talking about just making sure that we had an idea that became printed, we weighed a lot of options and um, uh, uh, Amazon, uh, Kindle Digital Publishing, would ended up being like the one that we wanted to do because it was uh-huh. the most um, cost effective for where we are because I mean, we're a startup. We ain't got that made a slang around. Um, and because it would, the, the turnaround time was so narrow. And the, the thing we want to do again was make sure that this idea we had worked out here in the real world and not just in our heads. That was the goal. So um, we went with KDP. Uh, Ken, uh, Kindle Digital Publishing, and once we had it, we were like, "Yeah, this is this is gonna go. Like, this is what we got." Oddly enough, make you laugh. We are currently exploring other printing options. Um, uh, uh, Jason Reeves over at One Three Three Art. Uh, he is one of our one of our publishers, one of our printers. Um, but we're looking at some other options. Um, but that size that you hold right there. That was the um, one of these size like presets for uh, Kindle Digital Publishing, and we wanted to we wanted to have a a book that was not oversized, and especially because this was still kind of our tryout period, trying to see if, if the if the uh, idea held water. Um, mm-hmm. We didn't want to go oversized and like get it back and be like, this ain't it, you know what I'm saying? So we uh, we went with the six by nine, and that has been kind of our lane uh, for the last couple of years. But you know, we're gonna try and expand that uh, that presentation vocabulary soon. So yeah, that, listen. That's in, in my opinion. Not only is that like smart, it's very resourceful, right? For so anybody who's looking and, and listening at this interview, who's also trying to get their work out there, you're showing them exactly how you got your story out there with minimal cost, you know, and. I'm holding it here, being a fan of the work and interviewing you, you know, and so that that could be them right now, right? So yes. that's that's great. I'm glad. I'm glad. Very glad you share that. Um, now let me let me ask you a little bit more about the world building of it, right? There is the realm of the natura. I hope I'm saying that right. Yes. Um, so it's a very interesting concept. I would love for you to kind of take us in there. Um, you know, the genre of the story from what I'm reading is more kind of action fantasy type genre. Uh, but I, I would love to kind of hear from you. Take us into the world and the protagonists a little bit and what they're facing and the challenges. You said, you know, it's drawn from real life experience of a, of, of a single dad. I, I, I'd love you to expand on that a little bit. Okay. So... The Natura environment, right? Um, I'm going to go ahead and say the word Naturaverse. I think the uh, company hyphen verse thing is starting to get a bit played, but uh, it, it works for here. The universe that we have created um, or that we are creating. Um, the tiny seed that I'll start you with is we are, the, the, the all of the stories that we're going to be pouring into and exploring are about um, balance and and the way that the earth the way that nature balances itself and how humans very often have to be reminded how to be balanced um there is a natural balance that is at at the heart of the of the conflict here uh there is a force that is seeking to undo that balance uh is seeking to uh 
draw all resources and I dare say all reality unto itself, so under, under its control. Um, and there is the natural world that we live in that uh, just like water always seeks its own level, like nature try, finds a way, always finds a way for everything to be able to sustain uh, for its season. So that's the, the philosophical heart. Apart from that, we talked about uh, Trapper and, um, and, uh, and Kaya, and they're, they're just trying to survive in San Diego, but the stakes are about to get high in the next issue or two. It's really going to skyrocket. Um, Silas is, is uh, one of our, he's a fire elemental. He learns he has a power and you know, learning how to use it. He's not necessarily the best student. Um, uh, Hurricane is is uh, family oriented. Like if there if there is any of our titles that is the most uh, sentimental, that allows us to take a break and be a bit more sincere and more human, uh, it is Hurricane. Um, Lycos is is the um, steel tech self made man. Uh, he's he's the most uh, direct and uh, and brusque and the, the most forthright of all of our characters. Um, and we have uh, Mars, who's kind of the the eyes through which all of these experiences are kind of uh, related. She has her own uh, frequency and, and, and uh, sound wave based powers that we are exploring. Um, so all of those characters individually are going to be dealing with uh, issues of balance versus imbalance. And as a collective, um, like what it means to live in this physical realm how this physical realm connects to the natural realm and how that even expands into a broad universe. Speaking of a broad universe, it uh, is in any new reader's best interest to pick up issue two of the Natura. It explains how the universe that these creatures inhabit uh, came to be. Uh, we have a, a binary uh, deity godhead uh, that, that is responsible for the authoring of reality as we know it. And you kind of get a, a chance to see like, what the uh for every is there is a not is um and what, what the not is uh kind of shape it takes um now all of that is the uh high flutin story the uh elemental powers kind of coming together uh this is the part where i tell you that again all of this is my brother's brainchild at heart we the writers who are on staff are, are you know bringing this to life um we, I talked about how Trapper is an autobiographical uh, sort of story, semi-autobiographical. The Natura concept was because my brother played the game uh, Alchemy. Uh, there's an old mobile game. I think it's still like available like on desktops or, or whatever, like on, on, uh, on, on the web. Um, and in Alchemy, you start off with uh, earth, water, fire, and air as these four elements. And as you combine the different elements, you create new things, right? Uh, uh, earth and fire makes lava, right? And then lava and earth makes volcano. You know what I'm saying? Um, um, what is it? Earth and, um, what is it? Fire and water makes steam, right? Um, and I think fire and earth and steam make iron. But as you put these combinations together, you spawn more and more and more and more and more things. So my brother was like, man, this is such a dope idea that putting these things together it creates something new like it, it spawns these new these new discoveries and the game is about combinations like the the original don't say original one of the versions that i played had 300 possible combinations where you could take just these four elements and the way you combine them and the things that they spawn off and combine those you could just build things out like there was Later in the game, after I made like, you know, 150, 200 something combinations, I, I like combined like two different things and made life. And I was like, that is so amazing. Then you take life and that's all, you know, branches a whole new, uh, uh, it sets off a whole new branch of creation. So all that was said to say that um, the Natura universe, like as we know, it, was inspired by this game. The idea being these combinations that you make, these, dis these discoveries that you make, um, the more that it populates, the more that you try new things, the more that you combine things, how powerful things become when you combine them. Our characters are, will in time be able to do that. They will combine these powers and become more powerful. At its heart, man, we're just saying that all of us are better together than we are alone. You know what I mean? Like the game starts with those four elements. If you never put them together, they just sit there. Um, and that's, what, that's what's happening at the heart of it, is we're better together. So that's it. I love that. Um, I, that, that, that that's, that's beautiful. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, 
there's a question that uh, I uh, usually like to ask whenever I, you know, talk to different creators. And this is something I've been asked before, which always makes me think about the stories I write or create. And the question is, why do you feel that you are the one to write this story, right? And, and, and for me, that makes me ask, okay, why do I care about this topic? Why do I care about uh, whatever this story is covering at a personal level? And what, what am I really saying about this topic that I've experienced and what, that I feel? So I want to ask you, you know, when it comes to this concept of balance or this concept of, you know, the importance of being united and being together, um, how has that personally, how have you experienced it? And what are you telling us with the story from your personal experience? What, why do you think you are the right you know, person to write this story, basically? And I know you said it's kind of your brother's uh, a baby a little bit as well. And if you have some insight into why he felt that way, I would love to hear that as well. So I started off talking about how, you know, I, I consider myself an only child, uh, at least certainly raised an only child. Um, and I know what it is like to um, lean on oneself, to, to consider oneself self-sufficient. Um, and those things are, you know, functional. But I look at myself and where I am now, um, 15 years in education, um, having written and uh, published uh, poetry and um, having not thrown any eighth graders out the window, um, <laughs> I could not have made it to this point on my own. Um, I could not have made it to the point where I was uh, confident in my writing, comfortable with my writing. Um, I could not have made it to the point where I was uh, trained enough, skilled enough, practiced enough to uh, faithfully deliver a, a solid story. I could not have done it by myself. We, we could not have made 50-50 comics by ourselves. I think that I am the right messenger for this story because every time I go to create, every time we, we uh, produce a new book, every time we bandy about these ideas, um, I remember what it was like for ideas to kind of rattle around in my head, right? And then I met my brother and we, you know, kind of tossed ideas back and forth. And then we brought on, uh, brought Lanisha in and she made those a reality, right? She, she took our hands and made us make those things real. Um, my life experience has been one where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That if it had not been for not just cooperation, but community, none of this stuff would have happened. You know what I mean? So I, uh, I look around at a world that my eighth graders have to inherit and I think about the, the 80s and the me generation that I lived through, the greed is good uh, worldview, the, you know, I, I got mine, you know, best of luck getting yours. Uh, I think that that serves, that serves our wants for a time. I don't think that it necessarily meets our needs. Again, in the, in coming from a community perspective, um yeah man i think that i think uh what is it if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together um there there too many people have have loved me and encouraged me and supported me and pushed me and guided me and trained me and been patient with me invested in me for me to think that i've done this on my own or that i could do this on my own as effectively as we've done it together so with that being the bedrock of the way that I kind of see the world and I kind of, you know, see the, the, the mission of the characters that, 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 have been, that have been shared with me. I think that uh, a lot of people could tell the story. I think that I, with the things that I have seen and the experiences that I have had, I think I got the right wheels and the right tools for the job. I think that that is, 
you know, just haven't haven't seen from the inside this life machine, having seen what it is like to have folks work with and for um, a vision, you know. Yeah, man. man. I think that I think that's what. Listen, I absolutely love that. Absolutely love somebody. Somebody who grew up in a very community oriented culture, right? Uh, Ethiopia is a very, very community centric culture. Uh, you know, it was a lot of, it was a, it was a big culture shock for me when I came to the United States, which has a more individualistic culture. Um, and um, as somebody who came from that background, hearing you, you know, share this part of your experience and where you're drawing, uh, uh, you know, your inspiration from, is just beautiful to hear. I, you know, it makes me feel even more invested in the story. Uh, and I really hope like everybody who's listening is also similarly invested and is curious about your perspective uh, on what it requires to build community, what the importance of community is and how far you can go together. Uh, I love that. Let me go to my next question. Um, okay. I heard you talk about your, your eighth graders. <laughs> um, that's one of the things, by the way, when I first met you at, at Gulf Coast Co Comics, um, that was one of the things that I, I just really admired about you. You're a teacher uh, in addition to being a writer and publisher. And um, what's that like, teaching eighth graders? How, how, do, you, how do you balance work and this publishing life? And also, uh, are, are your students fans of your comic? Do they get to read your comic? What, what, is, what are their thoughts on it? Okay, so what's that like? It is hard. It is hard. It is really, 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 really hard. Um, teaching takes up a lot of my time and my energy. Um, it is, oh, it is tough to try and find time to like, put bits and pieces of stories together. Um, so that is, it is difficult uh, to answer your question. How do you balance it? I don't, like I have not <laughs> made that happen yet. <laughs> um, but I do, I do find ways to, um, you know, when there, when there is a quiet time, when there's a quiet moment that I used to spend daydreaming, I now spend that time writing um, or planning or, you know, trying to uh, do something that makes, you know, 50, 50 go another, another step forward um it is it is tough but at the same time like because like i said the, the concept that i that i hold in my head of, of making sure that community works and making sure that the world we live in can envision something better like these are the things that, I, that we talk about in our language arts class um when we talk about the art and science of communication like it, it is it matters because the world that we live in is the sum creation of thoughts the better the quality of your thought, the better the quality of your world. Let's do that. Let's think better. So that is that is how very often my my teaching informs my writing and my writing informs my teaching. Um, to answer your question, yes, there are some of my students who uh, who are fans of 5050 Comics. Matter of fact, one of my students just last week, week before last, um, I had mentioned in class that I was part owner of a, of a comic book company. And I'm pretty sure I had told them this before, but these are eighth graders, they don't listen. So um, yeah, he was like, wait, comics, really? And I have one of the, the I have uh, the first two issues of the Natura, like right behind me on the, on my, uh, right behind my desk. I was like, yeah, those books right there. Like I wrote one of those and their eyes just got huge. I was like, man, I told y'all this in September, but anyway. Um, yeah, man. Like there, there are there are students who are uh, aware of the work that we do. Um, matter of fact, I had such an awesome moment with one of my former students, a sixth grader, this was years ago, even before Fifty Fifty Comics was breathed about. She was one of the kids that I would tell, like, "Yeah, man, listen, I'm gonna write a book. Like, I'm gonna do a book. You're gonna see me do a book." And here we are, like seven years later, and she uh, ran into me at, at Comic IndieCon. Uh, her family was like running the food truck outside. And I got a chance to like catch up with one of my students. She was like, "Ah, I gotta buy this from me because I was coming." So, yeah, man, uh, it is. It is. Uh, my school life is a trip. Uh, matter of fact, 
one of the reasons that I wanted to uh, kind of set up a, 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 a companion uh, comic strip uh, called Table 23 was so that I could take some of the craziness that I see in my middle school that I teach at and kind of funnel those into uh, uh, stories for 5050 comics. There's, uh, you, you've read Trapper, so you know who uh, Kaya is. Kaya is, is one of our main characters, Tyree's daughter. Um, and she goes to a middle school there in our fictionalized San Diego. So like I said, the, the silliness that I see in my middle school, Kaya gets to see some of that silliness in her middle school. So um, those experiences directly inform what I write for Table 23. So yeah, it's a close relationship there. I love that. I love that. I'm just going to take a quick pause here. Lee, welcome. Thank you for joining us. My uh, guy. <laughs> uh, Leon has definitely been representing you. I feel like I already know a little bit about you, uh, but I do want to give you a little bit of a moment here. If you can just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself real quickly. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've heard that you're kind of the brainchild of the stories that you guys are writing. So uh, please tell us your perspective a little bit about it too. Uh, first of all, let me apologize for being late. Um, it's the holiday seasons. You can see my two sons are in the background trying to sneak out of the frame <laughs> for whatever reason. So I'm out. I'm out trying to get last minute gifts uh, with them. So um, my apologies for being late. Um, well, but yes, uh, if my brother hasn't alluded to it, um, our story kind of started, uh, you know, a couple of years ago with developing this thing. Again, he mentioned probably that we we didn't grow up together. Our, our, our backstories are a little bit different, uh, but when we linked and he had the, you know, the writing prowess that he has, uh, again, I say this without hesitation, uh, probably one of the best writers I know by far, uh, easily uh, has championed a lot of what, you know, has fueled this business uh, when it comes to as far as the imagination, the fantasy part of it. The, uh, the the way the things they read in some of the stories, uh, like right now our crown jewel will probably be our Genesis issue. Um, if he hasn't told you that story, uh, literally the Genesis issue started with me just kind of initially just formulating the idea and just kind of drawing it. And then I'm like, well, hey man, I got a bunch of pages for this thing. Leon's, hey, put words to this please. And he just took it, I don't know, within a couple of weeks and just had it fully written out, script. I'm like, bro, this is amazing. This is the most amazing thing I've ever witnessed in my life. I'm like, I don't even know how you do stuff like this. And then he'll flip it on the other end and say, well, no, man, like I'll write stuff. And then you just took it and just ran with the art. And again, I don't know not growing up together and having that particular bond and be able to feed off each other the way we do is something that I've never seen before. I didn't know how to explain it to people at first because it was just like, man, he just, he has a way of words that allows me to create, you know, visually. And my whole background is in design. Uh, I work for an apparel brand, but I've been an illustrator my entire life. I've, I've drawn comic books my entire life as a kid, just growing up. You know, my whole dream was to always be able to put, you know, uh, characters that I developed in some type of storybook format to be able to share for the world, man. And uh, again, it's one of those ways that, you know, and this is going to kind of sound cliche or sentimental in a sense, but um, it's my way of just providing a gift. Right. So this is my gift and this is kind of my way I'm kind of expressing it to the world. And it's kind of the way I want people to, you know, know who I am, man. And if my, my mark is left by the work that I put out into the world. And it's a visual storytelling. It's a visual love letter to all the things that I kind of connect to. Um, it's worded by the way my brother puts things in perspective. So that's the compliment to all the art that I've put out. So um, I am I love that relationship and that symbiotic thing that we have going on and that connectivity. Um, I just want to be able to share that with everybody, man. So that's kind of the nature of what this business has been about. We are independent. We're trying to, you know, add to uh, what we are, you know, collectively uh, are as uh, creatives. Like we're a, an amalgamation of a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different people. Um, and ultimately, we're, we're trying to tell stories based on what these people are kind of, you know, imbuing into our stories. So we created a story arc. We said, hey, fill the, fill the gaps. You know, fill the gaps with your character and let's let's try to make a thing that's really cool and positive and, and something people can remember. So that's the game, man. Man, I, I'm just I'll tell you I'll tell you one thing for sure. Um, the relationship you two have 
and the way you collaborate is unique and not like a common thing you just find with any artist and writer collaboration in the comic industry. Uh, I know that for sure because I mean, I've, I've done several projects as well myself, but even from you know the creator friends I have and whatnot, uh, this kind of collaboration, this kind of, you know, even the way you guys talk about each other, it's like you can't wait to get into to to, to like to work together. It's like that that's not I mean, please do not take that for granted at all. That is very special. For sure. And uh, definitely, you know, protect it, nurture it, uh, and keep keep building off of each other. Now with that said though, I do have a question for you guys, kind of a trick question here. Uh, cause I'm gonna flip it a little bit with every relationship. There are areas that are challenging. I want to know, you know, even with your such strong and great relationship, what are areas that have been challenging for you? It could be individually, it could be as a group, whichever it is, uh, because, you know, I want to, you know, whoever is watching this, they're going to look at you and, you know, I want them to know that there's you know, great times and there's also challenging times and you just have to learn how to overcome those and develop steps for that. So uh, what has those been for you in the production process and the publishing process and the idea brainstorming generation process? Uh, you can just name like the top two problems or things you could have come up in your mind that have challenged you to grow. I, I could I could probably speak for one uh, that me and my brother both share. Uh, we both have day jobs. That's it. If this was our full-time job, if this was our full-time job, I'm like legit like, hey, we're getting paid. If not the equivalent of what we're making at either one of our jobs right now, if this was our full-time job, that would be so much easier. Right? That's why that that's my dude. That's why yeah. that guy, that's my dude. That's it. We it. talk about that all the time. <laughs> and and my brother, my brother is more animated about it than I am sometimes because he's just like, man, when I'm at school and I'm going through classes and I'm talking to these students and this, that, and the third, and it's just one of those down days. And when we get on a conference call as a team and you can just look at Leon's face, you're like, you good, bro? It's like, nah, nah, bro. It was a hard day. I'm like, oh, okay. I get it. I get it. And he literally will tell everybody that he talks to, he says, no, look, man, if I could just get away from this job and just do this full time, I'd do it. And I'm the same way, man. I'm literally the same way. I don't know another career path I could take, bro. I don't know. I've, I've worked in the military. I've done so much, man. But I'm just like, my heart is in creating stories. And see, and um, like, to be fair, like, I, I enjoy teaching. It is meaningful and it is an investment in the future. Like it is valuable work, but this country don't treat it that way. So, uh, uh, yeah, man, like if, if I could, if I could do this, like I, I mentioned earlier, like everything else is just costume. If I could get to who I actually am and get all the rest of that, you know, day job and, and stuff out of the way. Oh baby. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be a different day. It'd be a different day. Yeah. Oh man, I, I I understand that. That's that's something so common amongst in the comic industry, especially in the indie comic industry. Yeah. Uh, I that totally resonates. Um, I'm so sorry that, that we're coming to so close to time. Yes. I do have yes. two questions for you guys. Mm -hmm. The first question is going to be, if you had to give a tip for the younger version of you, okay? Let's go way back when you're first starting out. If you had to give them the top two, three tips, you know, what would they be? And then the second question is, where can everybody grab your work, find out, follow you? You know, what what, what do we need to do to be, to be all on your work? Let me know. It's on you, bro. Okay, <laughs> so how far back are we going? Like, how 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 young am I? Am I talking? You know Which, what? Let's go. Let's go to. I think you said 
fifth grade was the first time you kind of had that story story itch, but then ninth grade was when you said you're like leaning into it, right? If I okay. remember correctly. So okay. somewhere around that time. Okay. So if I had to go back and talk to that kid who was at my grandmother's dining room table and uh, tell him, give him some advice, I would advise him, keep writing and find every opportunity, find every way, every instance that you possibly can to do this. Like I would tell that kid then, there's every city or you know school district has the, the um, performing arts school, right? In, in New Orleans, it was NOCA, the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. Uh, and I had had friends who had gone to NOCA for uh, music and for uh, dance and for uh, uh, performing arts like acting uh, and for writing. I didn't even know that was a possibility. I didn't even know Noka had a writing like area, right? And at the time that I was in high school, I did not know that, again, I, didn't, I wasn't quite in tune with what this really was happening on the inside. But I'd tell my uh, fifth grade self then, I'd write it down and staple it to my forehead. I'd be like, listen, keep writing. And when you get the chance to go to Noka, go. That is what I would tell my younger self. That's it. <laughs> um, again, I, I can't tell you how uncanny me and my brother have a similar, <laughs> we have similar backgrounds and a similar <laughs> story, everything, man. So uh, I'm the same way, man. Uh, you know, fifth grade, Lee sitting in art class or sitting at, you know, math class doodling on his tablet or whatever and and, and uh, pen and paper and making comic books during the summer, taking notepads and fully sketching out panels and using rulers and erasers and ink pens and all sorts of stuff, man. Um, I tell that kid, man, don't get discouraged. Um, my art journey has taken, it, it was, it's been a roller coaster ride. It really has. Uh, for a very long time, it's been a roller coaster ride where there have been times where I was like, okay, I got to do this because it's something I love to do. And I, I'd be remiss if I told my kids, don't pursue the thing that you, you know, you, you love, don't pursue it because what if it turns into something for you? You know what I mean? So, but there's been a long, long list of whether or not it's come from internally or just externally, just doubt, you know, internal doubt is something that plagues artists all the time. It has plagued me my entire career is internal <laughs> doubt. Um, don't, don't listen to it. You know, that'd be the advice and just keep going and keep her and get, keep getting better. Um, it, it took you off your path early on. Um, you didn't, you didn't finish college until 2018. You went to art school later in your life. You, you, you worked every job, settled down, had a family, been in the military. You've been to war and back. You've done it all. You've been a manager. You've done a lot of stuff, man. And you, you had a long long productive life doing all the stuff that, you know, other people expected you to do. They expected you to do these. They expect you to do this, you know, because you are this person. You're, you were supposed to go to college to play basketball. You were supposed to do a lot of things that people's expectations were put on you and that derailed your own personal passions and things. So you literally listen to the doubters. You listen to everybody that put those expectations on you. Don't listen to them. Go, go pursue the thing that you want to do leverage it and make it your career and leverage it and make it something that people have to take time to look at and be inspired by. Don't quit. So, that'd be it. Yeah. Last piece, 5050comics.com. That's 50FIFTY comics with an X.com. Be sure to hit that up. Um, we will be um, unveiling uh, the new hotness as far as our website is concerned. In short order, 2024 is about to be on fire for the team. I'm just saying, like, I'm, I'm putting that in the air, in the atmosphere. It's about to go down. Um, but, yeah, you want to drop by there. You can uh, find out about the team. You can find out about our story. Uh, you can find all of our, uh, all of our products. Um, the uh, production schedule is going to be uh, ramping up soon, coming, uh, coming in the next year. We got some... We got some heat coming. That's all I'm gonna say. Listen, y'all ain't ready for Trapper Issue Three. All right, that's it. <laughs> so, fifty fifty comics five zero f i f t y comics with an x dot com. Uh, also, find us on Instagram, like at uh, fifty fifty comics. Same way, five zero f i f t y comics with an x. Um, also, find us on TikTok. 
Um, we floating around Snapchat. We still tightening that one down, but you know, we you find us on all those on all <laughs> those uh, socials and connections and all that. But absolutely. Also, keep an eye out for us. The con schedule for 24 is about to be crazy. You want to go to 5050comics.com. You want to sign up for that newsletter. You want to stay in the know. Find out where we going to be at. We coming to your city, baby, wherever you watching this. We coming to you. And when we come, we need you to be ready. We're going to have the 5050 comics. We're going to have the books. We're going to have the merch. You got to get it on. Your... Holla at the t-shirt, baby. It's, it's fresh and it's hot. So. 50 F I F T Y comics with an X.com. Find us in them streets. We can't wait to see your face. If you have one of our books, man, holler at us. Email us, uh, 5050comics at gmail.com. So tell us what you love. Tell us what you hate. Just get at us, man. This, this thing is really about to blow up. That guy right there with the artistics, you can't mess with him. My own bias aside, baby, listen, I'm, I'm going to put me aside. That dude you can't mess with. Now, if people have had kind words for me, that's all cool. Would that do right now? With the, mm, I'm telling y'all, get on the get on the natural issues one, two, and three. Get on Trapper issues one and two because issue three gonna blow your mind. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> awesome. All right, Leon, Lee, thank you so much again. I, you know, I'm sorry I have, I have to go. I, I I have another commitment, but I'll let Jeff take over. Jeff, if you want to take over, again, I will thank definitely you so do much. That. Hey, I, again, appreciate meeting you guys. Appreciate meeting you, man. Thank you. I apologize for coming in late, man. But uh, yeah, oh, good. I appreciate it. Good speaking Thanks with you. Thanks so much. Best it out. We're going to be reaching out. We got to get you on uh, on our podcast. We're going to be developing for the new year. Be ready. Yes, That's sir. Good. Yes, sir. See you guys. That's all right. Thank you for your amazing questions and your time, man. Really, Absolutely. really appreciate Absolutely. it. I appreciate so, it. No problem. See you guys. Before you go, before you go, let, yeah. the, people know, let the people know where they can find you at E10 Comics. We, you know, you, you shared some yes. amazing questions. You helped us open up this entire interview and you really showed a lot of perspective and mind work here with the wordsmith so i'd love for them to you know be able to track you down too because yes you have some heat on that side too just before yes. you depart because i'll deal with these two awesome. these two rambunctious crew we'll we'll get down to some more <laughs> a little bit. I'll, I'll right. want them to, have right. to know a little bit about you before you depart because you've done an excellent job with us here i'm so glad i'm so glad thank you very much um for anybody who is interested in african mythology African folklore, African yes, fantasy sir. stories. Yes, sir. Our company, Edan Comics, publishes African comics made by African creators from all over Africa, West, East, South. Uh, you can find us at ETAN Comics, Edan Comics on all platforms. Our website is etancomics.com. Uh, very, very simple to, to you know find us, easy to memorize. You just got to remember ETAN Comics. Again, I was Bessarad Deveza. I'm the founder and the writer of our stories. Uh, reach out to me. I love talking to creators or fans or anybody who just loves talking about indie comics, black comics, African comics. So reach out to me. And once again, thank you so much for this, uh, Jeff. I really appreciate this invitation. And Leon, so Lee, learned a lot from you. I will continue to learn a lot from you. Keep well, doing thank that. you. No, thank right. you. Thank I you. gotta go, guys. See you. Have a good night. How we going? All right. Listen, um, best that I had to go, but I want to make sure I go on on record as saying um, the comics that he does phenomenal. Like they really are. Yeah. Great. That he has he has a, a hardcover of the uh, first six issues of Jember. You really gotta get your hands on that. Like the story is dope. It's it's a fun, you know, discovering story, uh, discovering power story. Um, but again, man, the way that it is, it is informed by uh, his experience. Uh, like he grew up in, in Ethiopia. He came here in like his mm -hmm. teens, if I remember his story correctly. Um, the art is dope. Like he's a he's an excellent writer. He's an engineer by trade. But the the you just creative, comics on the side, like that's amazing. Right, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. But seriously, like you, you can't you can't pump it enough. He is him and his team, great work. Yeah, that's awesome, Absolutely. man. Absolutely. And Leon, so I'm gonna have to steal that one from you. I have Zufon, which an amazing read, same yeah. way, um, exploring the universe, different technologies, different races, and the complexities and the the storytelling alone is amazing. And the artwork doesn't hurt my eyes at all. They really correct, <laughs> really correct the visuals, so. I I I I'm very grateful for his contributions into the comic book world. 
Truly. I'm glad we get to shout that brother out. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about y'all's journey some more. I know we covered a little bit, but I wanted to dive in a little bit more um, with your story. And I really wanted to ask this. Lee, you brought up a an amazing point about expectations, right? And what that kind of did for, you know, the younger self and yourself and your both of yourselves. And when it comes to the journey of where you are now, how mm-hmm. do you, I guess, how do you manage those expectations now while transcending into the world of becoming a full-time comic artist or comic developer, comic writer? <laughs> how do you manage those expectations and how do you, um, I guess, help others, others address those expectations when following, you know, their dreams and, and, and passions. Uh, I got to say, man, um, a lot of this has been a learn as you go process. Like mm-hmm. there are things that I'm just discovering, like about myself, about other people. Um, again, I had to attribute a lot of my, my background to what I was able to accomplish in the military and just learning the, lo- those trades. And then even now, I work for a company that does apparel and the owner is is pretty pretty much has a background like we do. He started in comics and was able to put out a few books of his own on his own view and he was a uh what did he do? He's out of Chicago, he was a Marine and he just broke out into health. I just want to do comics, but he was into video game design as well. He went to school for video game designing. And so he uh he has a very big background. He has an excellent, he's a phenomenal painter. Uh, just a lot of those, a lot of things he's put out. Um, Leon's got a chance to meet him last year in San Antonio. Um, and even since then, he's been able to construct what would be a, um, a tabletop game. That's pretty interesting. Almost like a cyberpunk esque kind of, uh, Dungeons and Dragons mix kind of, uh, combat influenced tabletop game. And it's so well done, and he's done all the details and stuff. And he has the money to back it, obviously, because he's just rich. But, <laughs> um, but watching him and just having kind of a personal relationship with him as I've started this job. So uh, the Fifty Fifty Comics and my current job both started in the same year, and so having the opportunity to step into a full time position where I get to be creative literally every day i get to draw and be creative and think about design all the time it's exactly the thing i went to school for so mm-hmm. having the ability to do that and then working with an environment where you see how everybody manages it right okay not every idea gets put out there there are times where you have to put stuff on the chopping block and you have to make hard cuts with things and you have to make really critical decisions about real-time projects and that got me the 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 knowledge on how to manage the expectations of things, right? So sometimes with the team, we get a little like, uh, you know, we're, we're a little ahead of ourselves or we're, we're posting the stuff that, you know, hey, team, like maybe we need to pull this back because we need to make this make sense for a little bit before we start, you know, ramming it down everybody's throat. Like, let's, let's, let's organize our thoughts. Let's have a team meeting. Let's see what others' inputs are. Let's get people in and interview them and see where they are. Let, what cons do we need to go to to get the, the knowledge that we need to gain? I think the last indie con that we went to was so beneficial. beneficial uh, and my brother could probably back this up to how we were able to gain so much knowledge about stuff that we're not doing right now. And we see our bar. We see where we need to get to in order to be better. And that's what's pushing it. That's what the expectation is. It's like, hey, every year, and a part of this I can attribute to Lanisha as well, but every year is what are we doing differently? You know, what are we doing differently to move the needle? What are we doing differently to get it in front of somebody that we have pounded the drum? Like, Hey, we got a story to tell, man, who wants to listen to us and how do we do it? You know? So it's always about next steps, next steps, next steps. And that's the, that's my expectation that's my brother's expectation. That's Lanisha's expectation is that we have a goal. Like it's literally putting that goal in front of you and say, all right, we're going to keep shooting until we hit it. Keep shooting until we hit it, you know? And we hit that goal, set another one. Like what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? And we're not trying to do it all at once and we know we're not going to, but my expectation is to see growth. We started off with, you know, 
a few people in the beginning, and we're down to another number, and then we gain some folks. The way we do production is different. The way we're looking to do production in the future is going to be different. The way we're doing our website is different. Like, it's getting the next thing forward and pushing the whole group forward, and that's the whole point of it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by that, and I have to try to keep the doubt down that as if this is not a thing for me to do. And what silences that is when I see other people champion our product, right? They champion what we're doing. So it, it, it puts another, Oh, okay. So somebody is paying attention. Somebody's seeing what we're doing now. Okay, cool. It's not just me on a soundboard trying to get people to, Hey, watch us. No, people are buying our product. People are talking about it. They're asking questions. Okay, cool. Now we we got something. So let's. How do we build on that? How's the, what's the next step to that, right? And so that encourages me. So I just want to keep going with that momentum, man. I don't know how everybody else feels about it, but that's how I feel. <laughs> yeah, uh, managing expectations, man. Um, one of the things that, <clears throat> like uh, like like we said, like this has been a lot of uh, learn on the job uh, sort of experience. Um, in business, in in a niche market, essentially in a niche market of a niche market. You know what I'm saying? Like we, we're right. we're a bit specialized, but one of the things that I have learned, like with each new iteration, like with each new uh, barrier we clear, with e with each new uh, show that we do or book that we publish, um, got something to learn now, man. Like the expectations that you kind of have in your head, they don't really they don't really match up to. Let me rephrase that. We are able to write much more of our present and our future than I ever would have imagined. Like, mm -hmm. it took me getting to this point with these people at this time to see that, man, um, all of us are so much more powerful than we think. You know, all of us have so much more um, influence and, and uh, control over you know how this how the rest of the road kind of plays out than we think um i had some expectations about how this sort of thing goes like how what do you do like how do you how do you you know uh bring an idea from inside your skull to in somebody's hand printed and again there's no real you know hard and fast roadmap for that you know sometimes you do the words first and then you do it, and sometimes the pictures come to you and then you put the words in like the expectations are just those it's our brain having never seen a tiger trying to draw a tiger. Then you see a tiger be like, oh, wait, that's completely different. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what this experience has felt like over and over and over and over and over again. Well put, um, sir. <laughs> Very well put. Flexing is word nothing right there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well put. I just try to make it make sense. So that that's it. Like, if, if you talk about um, the expectations that you kind that are put upon us, mm -hmm. that we walk in with, a lot of it is is you know shadows on the wall, and you just gotta you know live the real life, and ha you have a hand in creating that real life that you live. Yeah, I, I love both of your answers. That was very well put. <laughs> uh, killed it. So I want to dive back into both of your backgrounds next. How we mentioned, both of you mentioned growing up apart, and then having this symbiotic relationship that sort of just seems like instant brain tennis when it comes to putting forward your gifts and ideas, right? So yep. I want to ask how imperative or how do you how do you feel about the impact of that separation? How do you feel that that impacted both development of your individual voices, but also as a catalyst for the chemistry of y'all now symbiotic relationship? Oh, that's a good question <laughs> um, right. i hope it made sense yeah. it was kind of you know it was, it was yeah. fighting me on the way out so i want to make sure yeah. You know. <laughs> oh yeah no no first on that one homie so i'm gonna say um we're gonna speak with, with reverence the name uh gloria yvette we're gonna speak with reverence the name miriam celeste uh those are my paternal and maternal grandmothers and from them and the uh, kids that they had, my parents and my aunts and uncles, um, the life experience that I had, I mentioned before how important community is. 
life experience that I had in both of those grandmothers' houses, it was wonderful to hear growing up how often um, my mama's mama, Mama Davis, how often people would congregate at her house. They always felt welcome at her house, right? And it was wonderful to hear how my granny, uh, my dad's mama, um, how people felt welcome in her house. Like there were people were always convening in her house, like on both sides, you know, in the lower night ward in New Orleans, these knuckleheads who run the street, they knew they could find uh, peace. They could find uh, food. Like at Mama Davis house, at Granny house, and the way that folks always felt welcome inspired me growing up. Like I watched it happen, even before I necessarily had words to describe it, I watched it happen with my eyes how people felt welcome. And I have watched my mama, I've watched my, my, my dad, I've watched my family members welcome folks, whoever, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, the the um, the Christian tradition and the, you know, love your neighbor bit, like I watched that thing walk even before I heard it talk, you know what I'm saying? So having that already built in from the ground up for me, when it turned out that I had a brother that I, I had not known about, what I know is folks is welcome in this house, you know? And so when it was, you know, time like to make connection, I was like, all right, I had this family before, now I got some old family. You know what I'm saying? Like that was, and and he, Lee can probably tell you about, you know, how uh, all of my cousins, or especially on my dad's side, like all my cousins, like when they found out about him, like, oh, wait, yeah, one more, one more, come on. You know what I'm saying? Like that is, that is um, what informed um, the new addition to what was my family circle. And then to find, and see, and that's the wonderful thing, man, when, you, when you're able to make connections with people, all of us, one way or another, in one vibe or another, in one form or another, we have these gifts to give. We have these things that we offer to the folks around us that make this life experience better. And when you when you wall up, you you deny yourself being able to connect that way. You know what I'm saying? Again, the natura at its at its heart is just saying, maybe we better together. And and like that, that I think is the the way that you know that that's what informed my my connection uh, with with this guy Lee Johnson. And then I saw him. I was like, oh wait, yeah, you're tall. You got to be in the family. Um, and like that, making sure that, that that bridge was already down so folks could like, so we can make a connection. I think that really set the stage for us making the discoveries that we have made, that we made then and have been making since. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's it. Um, yeah, on my side, man, uh, again, once again, my story is not too much different from my brothers, man, I promise you. Uh, and again, shout out to the grandmothers in your life, you know, uh, you know, they, uh, particularly in mine, man, mine's played such a pivotal role for me. Um, you talk to my dad, uh, I, when I got married, you know, my dad was very, like, emotional about it. You know, he pulled me to the side and he said, uh, you know, you, uh, I missed the majority of the time with you that I should have been able to be there for you. And my grandmother being my grandmother at the time, uh, I grew up in Johnson and not a hall, but uh, you know, she she was like, listen, and, and she's she's that beacon for a lot of people in the family. She's she died at 103 years old, you know. So um it, to this day, her her presence and, and what she contributed to so many people's lives was such impactful. So again, it's a house where you're in transit, come visit us up in 212 Kings Highway in Cleveland, Ohio. You know, come visit us up here. We got a we got a room for you as you're going from place to place. Or if you, you know, you down on your luck, you a nephew, you whoever, I'll take you in and just house you for a little bit until you get back on your feet. You know, so again, same thing. I'm watching her just be a steward of, you know, taking care of people, you know. And then again, that that DNA of service, right? Is service over self, always, right? So that morality was built into me early on, amongst other things. And then the military refortified that 
going forward, it's service over self. It's team over anybody else. It's over, you know, it's the bigger mission at hand over impose your own you know, your own needs. So that was the the overall arc of my my story there. Um, I would be remiss to say that, like the comment I said earlier about just having the doubt and having the uh, the self doubt, and then just kind of that external, you know, like man, you probably should be doing something else. I just imagine knowing that my knowing my brother, knowing my father for that instance, and how much not even growing up with them, but both of their imprint is on me as well. So I definitely feel like a brother and a son because of how they have been as a as a as a as a as a father son duo, both teachers. I have the spirit of a teacher in me. I have the spirit to coach. I have the spirit, you know, to do that stuff, to be that type of person, to give back to others outside of myself. So I get that. that that's a part of me. So that's a part of them as well. So that implemented a lot of my, you know, my take on it. The only thing I can't regret, man, and just kind of like, man, I wish, I just wish for, you know, for my sports career when I grew up in high school, just having my dad knowing he was a big time athlete and being able to just maybe coach me up to see where I could have went, you know, athletics wise to have my big brother who is just as much of an avid Batman fan and into comics and just a prolific writer, the damage we could have did growing up together as opposed to being separated would have been where would 50, 50 comics be right now. Had me and him just out the gate said, no, we're doing this. Right. Imagine where we would be at right now. So I, I, I wish we had that time to, 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 to make that connection, but at the same time, I'm like, nah, it's happening right now, and it's it, it's happening the way it's supposed <laughs> to happen. So I'm I'm eternally grateful for him. I'm eternally grateful for my my father and and being able to to really learn the lessons he's been able to teach me because he said, hey, look, man, you just turned forty, but now your journey started. Now you know what you want to do or go after it. You know, uh, my grandmother giving me that. That those heads up and pushing me, you know, to where I'm at now and taking it the rest of the way, you know. So, um, yeah, connecting those tissues, man, have been a very important part of me, man. I want to just keep that bond going, but that's just the fabric of what 5050 Comics is. That's why we have the name, man. Like, that's why the name is what it is, man. It's part him, part me. That was a beautiful explanation, and that and it makes you it makes the spelling of the title that much more. <laughs> Things connected. Yeah, I appreciate that explanation. Um, and if I may be so bold, I would like to say, actually, you know, not that my comments on the value of y'all's connection is means anything, but I think there's a lot to be said of we could think of what it would be like if we started at eight or nine or, you know, in fifth grade or whatever. But I think the beauty of y'all's connection now with the combination of y'all's varying perspectives with how your backgrounds went again, with the different grandmothers having the same result, um, your background, both the military is management and teacher Leon saving the world with these kids, saving these kids from the world, <laughs> you know, having those varying perspectives and being able to be the lights in those different areas. And now that y'all get to combine those lights and bring that to a different, you know, I think it's, I think 50, 50, comics sings a a a greater champion tune that way because the story was written that way if i could be so bold as to say it you know that that's just how i would share that you know that tip uh, with you all completely understandable i appreciate that i love that perspective on it absolutely yeah. of course of course um speaking of our past selves i want to ask this for leon's who do you write for and what impact do you want your words to have on their ears? And Lee, who do you draw for and what vision do you want them to receive? Holy crap, this dude has really good questions, bro. <laughs> Holy crap. I've never been asked that question before. Holy crap. You do. We need to hold music because that's a... You don't write for real. Like, what? Wow. Ooh, okay. Man, that's a, okay. Okay. Woo. Uh, okay. Okay, so um, I was in 11th grade, Miss Ward's um, uh, Black Literature class. And we got a chance to go and talk to uh, Sonia Sanchez. She, she was at Southern University of New Orleans. Um, and I remember her 
uh, talking about, she, she, she would, you know, she would shout some of her poetry, told some of the stories about some of her poetry. Um, and she would talk about like, you know, th how often our uh, difficult moments inform the art that we create. Uh, they inspire us in a ways, in, in ways that, you know, uh, happy times don't always turn the dial. Mm -hmm. uh, she talked about, you know, poetry or prose that she'd written that was sad. And, and she, uh, she said, and I, I'm pretty sure I've heard this in other places too, but she said the phrase, uh, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of took that to heart. And I, I, it's been a part of my experience kind of off and on. But after she said that, I became much more aware of it. Um, all that was a long-winded way of saying that very often my audience who I write for is sixth grade me. Like, I remember the stuff that I found flashing. Bro, stop taking crazy. my answers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, stop, stop taking right. my answers, bro. Stop. <laughs> Cut it out. <laughs> but I said that to say that, that as a writer, certainly you want to consider your audience, like, technically speaking, I am writing for, um, I guess, 16 to 22, sort of looking for the adventure, like looking for the the, the play and, and the danger and the, you know, the curiosity, right? I'm looking for those cats to kind of get in and play the game with. Um, but that said, when it comes to the writing and I, we're trying to make sure that the effect is having what I want it to have. Mm -hmm. I write, I write for the for the me that was that would watch cartoons. Like what I want to see this played out on a cartoon series. Very often when I play the scenes in my head that I write down, I imagine them as animated car, uh, cartoon sequences. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I try to make sure that they ring here because that's authentic. You know what I'm saying? Sonny Patterson is a is a, a spoken word artist and advocate and teacher from New Orleans. Um, I remember her. I told her once that I had written this poem for this, you know, young lady that I had eyes for, and she was like, uh, "Be careful with that, brother." Uh, it's it's a funny thing to write something for someone, write something for them. Like, if you're writing something for someone else, like, it's almost like you are giving the onus of value away from yourself. Like, you're the one who was entrusted with these words. You know what I'm saying? You are the one who's been entrusted to be a, a meaningful messenger. Like, uh, yeah, be careful with that. I was like, man, I had. To I thought I was, you know, putting down game. But maybe I, <laughs> I definitely wish I was doing that early. So I say that to say that, um, like I say, technically, like in in a, in a in a audience target sense, like I, I know uh, whose attention I'm trying to grab. But as far as the the feeling and the authenticity and sincerity, yeah, yeah, sixth grade me, that's my audience. It's beautiful. That's yeah. Beautiful. Um. I mean, you technically took my answer, but whatever. Cool. <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> so, uh, again, I would I would say eight and nine year old me. Um, you know, um, and then one other person would be my 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 best friend. Um, I tell this I tell this to a lot of people. I tell this to to most people, but his name is Tyree Tufts, and um, Tyree Tufts is the namesake of the trapper character in the story. Um, his daughter Kaya is actually my daughter's name, so um, so there's connected veins there. But ultimately, it's a story. It's me. I'm Tyree, but the character name sake of the main character in that book comes from Tyree because Tyree was my best friend and only advocate at the time for that comic book, that character. He was the oh. only person at that grade level at that age that <laughs> I was entertaining. I draw these things all summer long, man, and notepad after page after. I, when I'll tell you I was drawing colored pencils, I would go back and staple. I have issues upon issues upon issues of just stuff that I just put together. No publishing. Just, I drew these <laughs> issues, wrote them out, and made them a thing. I would get sketch pads and draw all summer long to make one comic book, right? Mm -hmm. Just to satisfy Tyree, because Tyree was so <laughs> fascinated. Bro, his name is Tyree. Yeah. And he's he's a Venus flytrap and a and a dude. Yeah. I gotta see more, bro. Like, show me more of this. I that is amazing. That is the most craziest thing. I've never seen nobody like that level of support early on, that level of just excitement, enthusiasm to a young artist and kid that's like, bro. 
you really entertained by this? <laughs> yeah. We're in the business to entertain, bro. We're in the business to showcase and take people's minds off of the day to day, bro. That's what this is about. And he gave me that nugget of, yeah, I'm entertaining that kid. But at the heart of it, bro, I'm entertaining myself and I'm getting gratification about it. I'm getting that gratification, that soul gratification of like something that I'm producing by myself with my own hands is impacting yeah. somebody else that I am not. It's, it's out of it's an out of body experience down there. So, yeah, those are the two people I was entertaining, man. And I just drew for them. Um, and I continue to do so. I just can, I, I'm trying to make myself as an adult, you know, fall more deeply in love with what we're doing. And the same thing, I don't talk to Tyree as much as I used to. He's got a family and all this other stuff going on, and we barely talk sometimes. But I, I every once in a while, man, I'll shoot him a cover. Hey, bro, this is the next cover. Or, hey, this is the new art piece I did. Same reaction. Oh my God, cannot <laughs> wait. What are you doing with this? We'll see, bro. Just I got you. Issue's coming to you with a signature, bro. Three, so just be aware. It's Shout three. Out to yeah. Shout out to Tyree. We all need a Tyree in our quarter. Shout so out. We, to, we, we to really do. We really Reminded do. Me of, reminding me of my cousin. I got a cousin named Tyree. I'm gonna give him a call. That's, a, that's <laughs> there you go. That's a beautiful story right there. I'm saying like, we all need somebody championing you that early, and he's just enthused, and he, now you get to see himself in published print. That's absolutely bro. That's amazing, man. And again, you got your parents and grandparents that champion. They give you that support and that love, and that goes right. a long way as well. Yeah, but it, it, it's something about the dude that you rock with every day. Like I rock with you every day, and you hype by this, bro. You here? Issue. This is the next issue coming out, bro. What you, you read? Yeah, okay, you know, cool. everything. You 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 can get it out. You get it all for free. That's awesome, baby. Of course. We hit, we hit, we hit, I told him this too. I said, bro, we hit it big and it becomes a full length movie, bro. I'm I'm bringing you to the studio. I'm bringing gotcha. whatever it is, but I'm bringing you so you understand gotcha. that this started because yeah. of your namesake right there. <laughs> yeah, he's going to cry in the car. <laughs> he was uh, right, bro. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to cry in the car, cry in the theater. He's just going to be crying. We cry. Um, yeah. that's, you know, that's a big thing to hold to his name. Um, so I guess that leads me to my next. What is the goal, you would say? What is the goal for 50-50 comics? What, at what point? I know there's never a limit as to what you can bring with it, right? But what is it that you really want to see with 50-50 comics? And then what is the goal that you want to see with one of your titles under 50-50 comics? I don't want to limit to which one as far as your titles, but what goal do you have for both? Um, I got to say, probably I posted this today on, on Instagram and Facebook, man. Um, with all the scandal, with all the stuff that's going on with the big name studios or whatever, man. And then I really took something away from indie, the indie con, bro. I really did, man. I just kind of really got my eyes open to the fact that the next big thing will come from that genre. It will come from somebody's book that was sitting in that hallway with us. It's going to mm -hmm. come from somebody there and that's going to take off and it's going to be this blockbuster thing or it's going to be this next big thing on Netflix or whatever and somebody's dream when they were nine years old, when they were in, in fifth grade, will finally come true and they'll get to see their baby in, in, in real time and like people entertained by it. People stopping to buy merchandise from it and they're you know, they're enthusiastic. They're wearing Halloween costumes with your, with your character and stuff like that. It's just like there's a revenue component by it but at the same time you cannot be like, what the heck? I watched Rob Liefeld. And if you know mm -hmm. Rob Liefeld is, Rob Liefeld created Deadpool. I, I watched the post of him just freak out over the fact that Taylor Swift was wearing a Deadpool costume for Halloween one time. And he's just <laughs> tripping out about it. Like, I cannot believe this superstar girl is dressed up as Deadpool. I get to watch this in real time and I live long enough to see it. What? Like, my goal is to do that. <laughs> That's what I want to do. So whatever that looks like, however that shapes up, that's what I want to do. I want to make that level of impact where people remember, oh, this is the guy that did it, man. And um, I want to be that. I want to be that group of destiny, man. I want to be that that group that does it. You know, I don't know how it's gonna look. I don't know how we are gonna get there, but we just gonna keep talking away at it. Yes, it'll, yes. it'll show you itself. Work until you make it. Um, I am going to reach back to um, my poetry experience. Um, very often we would talk to each other, um, especially in New Orleans. New Orleans is a tiny, New Orleans is a tiny city. 
So we ended up like going to venues and watching each other do poetry, like, you know, three or four times a week. And we would often talk about like what it is we want to do. Like, and of course, one of our smart asses, I can't remember which one, but one of us would say like, you know, I aspire to inspire. Like I aspire to be an inspiration to people. Like that is what I want to do. I want kids to, you know, flip through the pages of 5050 comics and then go to their notebooks and just start drawing. Man. I want people to read these books and be like, man, that's an interesting thought. I hadn't thought of it that way. Like that sort of thing. Like occupying somebody's imagination is such an important, it's such an, an important gift but to be able to give to somebody, to be able to just live in their imaginations, the things that we do with the, the space inside our skulls, terrible things can come from that, but brand new worlds can come from that. Matter of fact, um, I was talking to some of my colleagues at work and I would tell them about how, how I make comics available for our independent reading time because the 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 world that we inherit is not necessarily the world that we have to live in. And I think that it is important for uh, fiction, especially speculative fiction, to give us the imagination fuel that it takes to imagine a world better than this one. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that is what I want 5050 Comics to do. I want it to, to be the, the key that turns somebody's internal lock and be like, yo, let me try this. I want that. I want to, I want to set folks' imaginations on fire. Because again, that is how you make it to a better world than the one you've inherited. Yeah. Beautiful, eloquent answers again and again. So, <laughs> yeah, y'all credit my questions. This is y'all's fault. Y'all give me so much time. <laughs> you answers, you know, it's, it's, it's y'all. The inspiration is always there. Um, we'll tie this in with this. Lee, you mentioned powers. Our whole conversation is over just with this niche. Powers is a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, We'll ask one of the, it's a two part. The first, the more generic of them, is if you could choose a power, what would it be? The second, we'll wait until you answer that. Oh, man. I don't mind. Flight. I why? You that. And why? And why? And why? So um, I'm terrified of heights. Like, heights just make me like get dizzy, throw up, and pass out. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, man, it's funny, like, especially like on my way to work, there are um, crows and buzzards that live in the trees that are not far from my house. Um, on my way to work in the morning, um, I can see them just, you know, up there soaring on, a, on one of the clear days that we have here in Houston. If I'm riding and I see the crows up high, wings spread out and they're just soaring like that. Man, the way that must be. Also, um, the um, we have hawks, uh, red tail hawks that live in the area, mm -hmm. and they are another one. Like they get, they get up and they circle really high, and I'm like, some, I have seen, I have been driving home and have watched them swoop down and like grab roadkill and like fly off. Um, but just that idea, being able to be up there and move that way. Matter of fact. Um, I am kind of piece by piece putting together like collections of, of old Falcon uh, uh, issues, and the you do like Falcon a lot. I do, I do. It's the wings, man. It's the wings, and at the same time, like Superman can fly. You know what I'm saying? Storm can fly, but it's the wings though. And watching those wings just be out, watching them manipulate, and watching them like Chevron. What is it? Um, I read a Vixen comic once where she was, uh, she was. Um, uh chasing down some bags someone and stole something important and she uh she took on the the, the she took the power of a falcon a peregrine falcon and she said that most people think that the fastest animal on earth is the cheetah that's the fastest land animal but in a power dive a peregrine falcon that that has its wings chevron and it is a in a, and is in a perfect dart gets upwards of 230 miles per hour streaking mm -hmm. towards the earth and I'm like, that is so amazing. Just that idea, being able to do that and then whip your wings out and soar and just turn, master that blue. Good God, I want to fly. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. I have 
thought about this before a long time ago. And I was just like, man, I love the Incredible Hulk. I love the idea. I love Superman and having the ability to have just super, super, super strength, right? Um, I always thought about, man, well, how well, that and then maybe being really fast. I was like, nah, what always was like your fallback? So the Trapper character was my jump off character. Out the gate, this is my first comic book character I ever, I ever created. Watched, read a bunch of Batman, Swamp Thing comic books. He was my like, okay, he's got a combination of two. He is a combination of Batman and Swamp Thing put in one body. That's literally who Trapper is, right? Fighting bad guys, clipping, you know, tentacles and and Venus flytrap batarangs the guys, right? His his whole aesthetic screams those two. Well, the early drawings of him, I have to show you those. Anyway. Uh, I ended up creating a secondary character because I was on this Avengers Justice League. He needs a partner. He needs a team up here. We need to create a team. So it went as far as one other character. Well, two, but one other character. His name was Midnight. I was like, oh, Midnight. Okay. Um, he has this power of like darkness and stuff. He could dip in that in the third. But then I think one story I wrote and he had, um, he had gone through this transformation. He had this bad guy he had fought called the grave like this dude was like death incarnate and just he, he he destroyed this dude in a fight and he had to find some way to champion his power and get back in the fight and take this dude down because he was destroying the city what powers could i give him i don't know i like lightning right so i gave him all these like he up armored his body and then i took it a step further i was like all right he's kind of like iron man essentially but that's cool. He's got these shadow abilities, but now I need to take a step further. What would that look like if it was another guy better than him? I came up with a character called Stratus. Pure lightning abilities. We're talking Lord Raiden, mm. Black Lightning. Mm. He had a staff, mm. but he had a full-on staff thingy spear with this cool face visor thing. Leon, I might introduce him one time, man, and make him a mainstay on the stories. But Please. his name was Stratus. Like a bad man. Yeah, and he was just a bad boy. He would come in and just wreck shop. And I always imagine, like, Raiden, man, he'd come down, and, and any time I've ever seen Raiden just teleport in and the lightning just boom, yes. and then he just takes off, and then yes. he's just firing electricity at guys and just taking dudes out, bro. Like, I would have lightning powers mm. straight up. Yeah, I'm straight up electricity. Blue and white is my outfit. I got a cape. Whatever. You know what I mean? Like, that's me. Okay. As a Mortal Kombat fan, that <laughs> is one of the first games I played. I highly love that answer. <laughs> like, highly love that oh, answer. Oh, yeah. I'm talking everything Raiden could do, this dude had the ability to do. Like, that was Raiden top-notch to, to the Let's team. Get it. Raiden yeah. doesn't give, get as much praise as he should, you know. That's, <laughs> he does, let, he let's does. be honest here. We yeah, all he talk does. about this thing, but come on now. Who's got him out here? Who's got him out here? Right, like you running the whole shit, bro. Like, come on, dude. But but rated. Did nobody watch the first Mortal Kombat movie and how dope he took out Sub Zero and Scorpion in that? Come on, bro. What? Apparently not. I don't know. I don't. Luke Kang can't get his kicks off if Raiden wasn't there to help him. Thank you, man. Come on, dude. Like the, the electricity in the eyes. He does the finger thing. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Who wouldn't want that? That's just so cool. He he's a bad man. bad man. He just threatens you by just giving some sparks it's, out real quick. Exactly. Come on, on, man. And I give credit to Black Lightning. Black Lightning, when I watched it, I was like, okay, give right. some credit to Black Lightning. This is, a, this, is a, this is an okay attempt at doing the lightning powers. Okay, I respect it. It's this cool. Uh, but yeah, Raiden, Raiden in Mortal Kombat was my guy. So yeah. He embodies there's lightning in the blood. That is, mm. that's yeah, it's just um, dumb. Love the answer. My follow up is: What do you think? What would you say is your superpower now? As in reality? As in yes. As in your reality in your human form right now. What is the superpower that you're championing here? Oh. Hmm. Empathy. Being able to see people. That's beautiful. Yeah, being able to see people. Um, 
this whole thing kind of started from the two of us. But what I've been trying to do is, is and, and it's not, we don't talk about them as much as we need to, or we're going to, but it, my brother can tell you, when we started this thing, we said, okay, we got a creation story. We got an alpha timeline of events that are going to happen in the story that we pre-planned out and said, this is what this is, right? However, I made it very clear to my brother. I said, the problem with a lot of these, these books and stuff sometimes, or even with these major studios coming out with movies is, you know, they fail to capture the human element, right? They fail to capture what it is to be involved in this situation and what the human scale, the toll that it's taking on them and their families and where are they coming from in that perspective in the grand scheme of thing that's going on. That led to us saying, look, we need to branch that timeline out. We'll keep the same main timeline, but we'll make this B timeline. That B timeline will be for anybody that wanted to jump on board with the ship that we're building and say, hey, I got a character. I want to plug him into this particular point in time in our timeline, and I want to write this story for him. Can you put a book out with it? Done. You get Hurricane Ida, Silas, Lycos, Metal Wolf, Mars, and you get Trapper from that timeline. That's literally five characters that we had the chance to introduce and fill in because people were empathetic to our story and thought this was a cool idea. I want to be a part of it. Let me write this character. And or maybe I started a comic book prior to this, but I just never got the traction I needed to even get it off. What can you do with this? I'm saying, well, hey, look, no, we'll write it into what we got going on and make it a mainstay there. So this way you have a vested interest and what goes on in the main timeline because your character is written into what we're doing. So it, you, you're, you're a pillar now, right? So that is the, the, the ability to empathize with what people like myself and my brother have been always trying to do for the longest time. This isn't the first attempt me and my brother have tried to make a comic book. We had tried once before and it failed miserably, right? <laughs> because we got a bunch of creatives together and said, hey, we got ideas and blah, 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 blah. And it's just white noise of people just trying to just put stuff out in no direction, right? Nobody so, makes the jump the first time. Right. So <laughs> we got a good. Thank you, sir, for that quote. Uh, yeah, I love good that. Job. <laughs> good job. You can make the climb. <laughs> Let's eliminate all fear. Good job. Um, so, yeah, it's it's about putting people together that are passionate about the projects, empathizing with the character and what they're trying to tell. And my superpower is being able to visualize it like I see it. Right. My brother will attest to this 100 percent of the way. Anytime he writes anything, I tell him, bro, I see that. I see the scene. <clears throat> I see it. I already see it. Don't even you, you got. Stop right there. I see it. All right. I'm already, I'm already sketching it out, bro. Don't even worry about it. I got it. I know what you're trying to do. Done. Right? That's like that's been that way with everybody that's come to the table. I have I can see the potential of what you're trying to do. I know what I need to do to try to get you there. And I don't care if I gotta sacrifice my time, but I want you to have a finished project that at the end of it, you have your name on it with our logo and it says 5050 comics on it. And you can say to your grandkids and kids before that I wrote a comic book and I got my name on it. Don't well, sound like a coach. Don't he sound like a coach? Absolutely. You know, he said it's in his blood now. He said it was in his blood. I guess it's in the blood, bro. <laughs> um, I think, I think that my superpower now is perspective. Uh, I think that, um, and I'll say that, um, Especially like in in the course of my my uh, collegiate studies, like that really started to kind of to uh, you know kind of crack the door open. Teaching has kicked it off its hinges. Um, when you are tasked with making with being a part of someone else bringing in an idea and helping them to realize an, a, a new understanding, you learn you learn. You learn to put a lot of keys on your key ring mm -hmm. to try and find out, you know, which ones fit, which locks open. Um, and you just start to see you, you start to see from more than just your own point of view. There are things that you are you are made aware of that you have to now value. I remember the school, the first school I started teaching at. 
uh, full-time uh, middle school, there were a lot of students who, I mean, I've taught at Title I schools my entire career. So there are a lot of students who come in with, uh, with, uh, with socioeconomic uh, issues, with mobility issues, with, you know, issues of homelessness and hunger and, and, and um, you know, access to resources, whatnot. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of acting out. I mean, it's middle school in the first place. So people are impulsive. We are learning how to become adults. Um, and then when you add these other um, uh, social layers on top, like that can be very difficult. One of the things that I have learned, even with the most uh, challenged um, or impulsive young person, um, a lot of knuckleheads that I've ever dealt with, just need to be listened to. And yeah. when you are able to uh, listen to them and see a thing that you were likely blind to had you not put in the time and been willing to accept a new point of view, a new perspective, mm -hmm. it is it is amazing how often people cooperate with you, people trust you, people listen to you. You know what I'm saying? Like I, that has been the thing that I have found so often over and over and over again and um being able to gain and gather that perspective has been um has been a, a great and tangible benefit to my life i think that that is my superpower is being able to see things from more than just my own vantage point um yeah man it's, it's been it's been a gift Amazing answers to both of y'all. Like I said, y'all super power people out here doing <laughs> more than the Lord's work. Y'all doing that, all that and then some, you know, both helping cultivate lives and then creating other lives on the side of that. So that's that's superpowers on top of superpowers. Um, no trying. Y'all are doing, you know, do or do not. There is no try. Y'all listen no to y'all very well. Yes, um, so, yeah. So I guess we should be railing this in. It is getting late. To have our, you know, our, you know, to we got to recharge our superpowers. I know we got dead oh, sides out here. We, yes, have, we have responsibility. We into the winter break too. Man, listen, yeah. pray for teachers. Listen, I, I am. I'm praying for teachers, parents, everybody in between and around because y'all, y'all right. are, are strong people. But right. before before we before we leave the people with all this knowledge, I want to ask them. I want to ask y'all what, as a parting gift, what is it that they should be looking out for with 50 50 comics and you all for 2024 what is the what is the biggest thing you want them to to, to keep an eye out for that's a tricky question you want to go with me well i would say the growth man uh, uh again tying it back to that bro it's just the growth like literally just trying to see where you know uh again we don't we don't always get all the support that we want all right away, man. So that's fine. That's all well and good, man. But um, this is, these are proving grounds for us. We want to show the growth. Uh, I want to turn people into believers, man. Like, I, I want to shut up the doubters, man. Because, you know, uh, the main thing is, what's kind of a nagging voice in the back of my head is, is that nobody nobody's going to trust what you're doing until you prove it to them. They don't know what you're doing. They don't know what we're doing. Like, I post stuff all the time on social media. I got people that post stuff all the time on social media. Barely gets any views or likes or whatever. People don't care. Okay, cool. I'm going to make you care, right? I'm going to make you pay attention to it eventually, and you're going to pay attention to it because I'm going to keep pushing at it, and I'm going to show you what diligence and temperaments and resolve looks like because I want this thing to succeed and be something that we stood on, we got it out the mud, and we created it on our own, and we went through the trials and tribulations to do it, because a lot of people set out, and they want to start businesses, they want to do a bunch of stuff, man, but they never have the heart to stick it out during the bad times, and that's the thing. I want to show as much growth as possible and show people this is the real deal. We're not BSing. This ain't no side little, you know, um, small thing, man. We're taking it serious. We want people to take us serious, and we're going to try to push and do it whatever we can, man. So that's that's the thing that people need to watch for that. So watch the measuring tape. Watch the benchmarks that we hit. Um, on the heels of that, we were, uh, me and my partners were having a, a, a business meeting one time, and Manisha said, uh, like, for the point that we were at, like, we were basically commitments, and we're going to have to follow through with them. Uh, Manisha said, yep, yeah, that's it. We, we stuck. And I said, no, 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 we are not 
unstoppable. We are committed. That's mm-hmm. what this is. Mm-hmm. We are committed. Like this thing is real. Like this is as long as we breathe it, it's live. It's going. Like we don't need the long haul, baby. Long haul. That's that's thing number one. Um I oh. am going to say that I want y'all to look out for this uh Ill Intent mini series that's gonna be coming out soon. We should be right back. Because listen, you've seen our heroes in action. You've seen the universe that uh, that you know that was created for them to, to operate inside of. You've gotten a glimpse at who the natural actually are. You've seen their faces and their names. The threat though. Like you gotta see, you gotta get you gotta get a handle on what it is our heroes gonna be facing. So this uh Ill intent miniseries is about to drop. That's gonna show you. What, what, what the immediate threat is, and it gets tougher from there. That's thing number one. Thing number two, yes, I'm biased. Go ahead and put that on the table. But when you get to the last two pages of Trapper issue three, you gonna email me and be like, hey, Lee, you was right. You got it. You held. That was it. You gonna email me that. So keep your eyes I just try, man. I just, I just draw things, bro. I just I just drop man. I don't know I don't know what to tell you. I just drop, bro. I don't know what to tell you. Just trying Wait to make things look cool. Draw, Wait till you see. Just trying to make it look cool, bro. That's all. That's all. Ill intent, trapper three. Get ready. That's not even counting some of the other hotness is coming. Ill intent, trapper three. Be ready. I'm excited to see all of that. I'm excited to see trapper three. Do we have a perspective uh, date for uh, ill intent? Getting the exclusive news, what's going on? Do we do we have a projected date on that? Well, we're trying to organize the with the hold up is and this is some inside information for you, but the hold up is trying to structure all four stories in either to one book or split the book or put it out as all four issues individually. Just haven't decided how we want to do it yet. So that's the hold up right now. I don't intend to not release that thing later than July, like the whole thing, July. So that's my intention. That's the goal we set out. We have, uh, you know, two of the issues completed, and we're working on a couple more. So we got some people that are different artists outside myself working on these projects. So we are we are diligently having people apply their skills to it. So again, we like, hey man. Um, the buy-in for you, man, to get your name and, and art out there is to put, put pen and paper to these comics, man. See what your art looks like and what it can do. But I promise you, we'll get it in front of people and see if people will, will bite on it, you know? And that's the whole point of it. So, yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Looking forward to it. July is about next week. So, I'm excited to see what <laughs> it, it is next week if you haven't, haven't changed your calendar in a while. Yeah. <laughs> But no, I listen, gentlemen. I really enjoyed this experience sitting down, chatting with y'all. Uh, loved hearing a lot more of your story, getting down into the nitty gritty of y'all's y'all's story. So thank you for taking this time with me tonight, spending this time with me and Bessa riding, you know, Gulf Coast Cosmos. So I'll let y'all go. Um, pardon gifts. Anything you want to leave us with? Not bad. <laughs> Five zero F I M C Y comics with next dot com. Um, GCC comics dot com. Baby, listen. If you're in the Salute to GCC, bro. Salute to y'all, man. Uh, y'all have been doing uh, again from the bottom of my heart, bro. Like to walk into that place and to really see what the passion of somebody really loving comic books and being able to open up their own thing, bro, and just put put those books out there, man, and then be really just investing in the community and that being a resource and a place to just come and just, like, lounge out and just talk shop, bro. I love that place. Like, I really advocate for that, man. So I definitely love what y'all doing over there. I appreciate how organized it all is, man. I just love what you guys going on. It makes me want to get invested and do that thing for us, man. We want to put out a whole shop ourselves man or maybe there's a way to expand gcc here in the san antonio or damn cleveland or something like that man like there needs to be more you guys out there there needs to be a franchise something bro like i don't know what we got to do but but yeah i i love everything that y'all do man so i really do and i appreciate y'all taking the time to put our books out there and and shout us out when y'all can and put these interviews out here for us man so we uh again 
You've been a gracious host, man. You have some very poignant questions, man. I, I love everything that you're about, man. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited to be working with you guys for sure. Yo, listen, if you're watching this, um, make plans every third and fourth Saturday of the month, man. Come through and holla at Geek Me. Geek Me be so fire. Like, it is so much fun to get together with some folks, talk comics, talk life. Like, I'm telling you, I've had some of the best philosophical discussions with a bunch of comic book nerds, man. You would not believe how dope and deep it gets. Like, it's so awesome. Comic Book Club, uh, last Saturday of the month, we all, we have a title. We read that thing. We come in and we kind of, we, if you really want to get a deep dive into story, get a deep dive into art, oh, man, it's a good time. So if you're in the Houston, Texas area, if you happen to be around third or fourth Saturdays for sure. You for sure. Yeah. So, many thanks, gentlemen. You know, all thanks and praise go to Big Big Byron Kennedy with you know the creation of Golf Coast Cosmos Comics. Big B, uh, right there in Third Ward, Houston, Texas. Uh, you know, of course, anybody's welcome. Comics, blurs, everybody in between and around, anime, everybody, video yes. games, whatever your take is. You know, oh, love it. If, if it's some you would have got laughed at in the eighties, nineties, or whatever, <laughs> now you know, come on down. We got some space for you. There you go. Come on. You Come on. Bring, bring, bring your nerd. <laughs> oh, Jeff, you muted. There I guess, you go. I, guess I wasn't saying too much, right? But, but <laughs> when it comes to it, and I just wanted to mention, just because you brought this up, we do have some exciting geek meets and, com and book clubs coming up. But one I want to put on y'all's radar in March. Okay. okay. Excellence, volume one and two. And uh -oh. I know that movie that's yeah. coming out. Yes. 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 This is the Associated Medical Needle. Yes. Yep. Okay. That, so we watch out for that. We're going to, you know, you mentioned philosophical. We're definitely going to be having a an in depth discussion on the tropes that that movie is going to be exploring and the ideas of a magical black world. So, what? In there. Yes. Let's see what we can do with that one. So, we got to. Y'all will see the schedule coming out soon of everything yeah. else. But that's just yeah, one right. I want to put on y'all's radar if you can make it. That's, yeah, that's deep. That that sounds like something we need to be hosting in and and our our podcast, bro. For real, <laughs> <laughs> we can get we can get real intellectual on that one, homie. Oh, that man. one's gonna be fun. That's that's a fun discussion all around. So, whenever y'all ready, yes, what's no up? doubt, no doubt, yes, no sir. doubt, brothers. It's been a blast, man. I had fun, man. This was great. I was able to participate. Truly. Truly, thank y'all for for joining. Thank y'all for being here. Thank you for having us. Amazing to see brothers doing their thing and being able to tell people the world. So thank you, thank you so All much. Right. All right, have a good night, gentlemen. Later on, later. later.